friends and welcome again to Panorama of Prophecy. We want to welcome all of you for joining us here in person. Thank you for coming out this evening. We've had a good time studying the Bible together, haven't we? Amen. There's always something new to learn. I mean, I've heard these presentations many times, but I just mentioned to my wife the other day, I said, wow, there are things that I've never heard that's brought out from time to time. So it's just great to be able to gather together and study God's Word. We want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. Thank you for being a part of our extended, extended audience for this Bible study adventure. I'd like to remind you that tonight is lesson number 17. For those of you who are here, I hope you received your lesson coming in. It's entitled, Refusing Babylon's Buffet. Interesting study today. So for those of you who are watching online, you can go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you can download today's lesson. You can follow along. There's actually a place where you can fill in the answers as we go through the study. We also want to tell you about our free offer for tonight. Now, this is a special free offer. We don't always offer this, but this is one of our magazines and it deals with the subject of health. It's called Amazing Health Facts. And if you'd like to receive this, a digital download of the magazine, all you need to do is text the word healthiness to the number 40544, or you can visit the Panorama of Prophecy website. And again, it's an entire magazine dealing with eight Bible secrets of living a longer, healthier life. So for those of you who are here, you'll receive your magazine as you leave today. For our friends watching online, please take advantage of that free offer. You will be blessed as you read through what the Bible has to say about health. Well, at this time, we're going to begin by singing our theme song. So I want to invite John Lomacade and Kelly is going to be playing the piano. And as usual, let's stand as we sing together, Help Me to Know Your Will. Help me to know your will, Lord, that I might follow thee. Make me to hear that still, small voice tenderly calling me. If wind and waves 
start mounting Speak the words, peace be still Give me the mind of Jesus Show me the truth that frees us Together, I want to do what pleases you So help me to know your will Lord, please help me to know your will. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we never want to begin a Bible study without first pausing and asking for your spirit to come and to guide our hearts and our minds. Lord, we know the Bible is your book and we need the spirit to help us understand it. So be with us this evening. Be with those who are joining us online watching across the country and all around the world. Be with those who are here, and in a special way, we ask a blessing on Pastor Doug as he opens up the Word and speaks to us tonight. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And again, it's that time for us to take Bible questions. And I know we've got so many questions that are coming in. We want to thank those here who have written down Bible questions. And again, if you have a Bible question, Maybe while we go through the presentation, you get an idea and you say, I wonder what that means. Just write it down, give it to one of our volunteers, and we'll get that to Karen, and Karen will read those Bible questions. We want to thank those who have sent in your Bible questions at the Panorama of Prophecy website. Just a reminder, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can just type your question right there in the comment section, and we will try to answer as many of these questions as possible. So with that, we'll invite Pastor Doug and Karen and they'll be leading out in the Bible questions this evening. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Good evening, friends. I want to welcome you. Thank you for coming to the Panorama of Prophecy programs. And so we're just so glad to see each of you here tonight and looking forward to answering your Bible questions. I was almost sure she usually follows me wherever I go. They're having a conference back there. Your lesson. Oh, oh, sorry. We'll get it. We, we'll oh, okay. get. We'll find the lesson. I She's responsible to... to bring up my lesson and put it on the podium. And I didn't do it, so I went to find it. I couldn't find it. And while we're we're dealing with the technical things, my monitor's not on yet, so somebody in the studio might get that turned on. All right. All we, right. Where were we? Where can we can go ahead and start, though. Here we go. If we meet Christ up in the air, how is this different from the rapture? Well, it is the rapture. Rapture means to be caught up. And so we believe that when the Lord comes, you can read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise. That's the rapture. The issue where there's some confusion among Christians is when does the rapture take place in connection with the tribulation? Is the rapture before the tribulation? Is it after the tribulation? And is it a secret? We've been contending it is not a secret because it tells us the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, 2 Peter chapter 3, in which the heavens pass away with a great noise, the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth and the things in it are burned up. And so certainly life does not go on for another seven years after the Lord comes as a thief. People always say the secret rapture is because he's coming like a thief to take people away. It says the earth is destroyed, the elements melt, the earth is burned up. So. People, believers, are still called up when Jesus comes. Uh, it's just not a secret, and it happens right at the end of the tribulation. All right. Why well, did... Yes. Re I yes, I right. agree. Okay. <laughs> I agree. Why does Jesus say, Father God, forgive them if Jesus is our Father? That's confusing. Uh, the other day we had a question about uh, Isaiah chapter 9 where it said, um, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And technically, since all things that were made were made by Christ, the Gospel of John chapter 1, that would include us. And if he made us, if he's the creator, then it's appropriate to call him Father. But when Christ was on earth, he told us to pray in this manner, our Father. And he always referred to God the Father as Father. Uh, and th this just helps us understand that there are varying roles among the persons in the Godhead. Um, but Jesus is technically also our Father. They're one of the many metaphors. Again, he tells us, call him our, our brother, our friend. He's our savior. He's our substitute. He's our sacrifice. He said, I've, he's called the servant. He said, I've come among you as one that serves. 
Someone one time said that if you start looking at the various titles of Jesus in the Bible, you can probably come up with 50 different titles. Just in Revelation, since we're dealing with prophecy, he said, I am the I am, he's the door, he's the bread of life, he's the living water, he's the alpha and omega, he is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And you can find he's the one who holds the keys, uh, just so many different titles for Jesus through the New Testament and especially in Revelation. Okay. Father is one of them. Is it okay to cook during the Sabbath day? Well, it tells us in the uh, Bible that six days a week, the Lord would rain down manna and they were to gather what they needed for that day, mm -hmm. except for the sixth day, which we call Friday. And um, they were to gather twice as much then, so they would not have to go out and gather. And then Moses told them, bake what you're going to bake and boil what you're going to boil, because tomorrow is a Sabbath. Get all of your, you know, major cooking out of the way. And that doesn't mean that you need to eat cold food. In our culture, it's so easy to nuke or warm up or, uh, your food. And, uh, you know, some things may need some final preparation. But the principle for the Sabbath is you don't want to be slaving over a stove. You're supposed to be resting. It's a day of rest. You want to spend that quality time with the Lord, with your family, with fellow believers. And so any of that major cooking should be done ahead of time. Yes, and we have time bake on our oven. Yep, exactly. which works really Come well. Come home and you hear ding, it's dinner time. <laughs> That's right. It was said earlier that the devil can't give life. So what does Revelation 13, 15 mean? Yeah, in some versions it says he gives life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should, sp uh, should speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. It says, well, I thought the devil can't give life. In the original, I believe it says uh, he will breathe into the a beast. The beast, and we've got a lesson coming this weekend, please don't miss it, talking about the beast and the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. uh, the beast is not a person uh, that is resurrected like a human. Uh, the beast is really an institution, it's a power. And so this is gonna be mobilized and activated by the second beast. It says the second beast, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. You know, we talk about the mark of the beast. If you read Revelation 13, there are two beasts in Revelation 13. Second beast is helping to breathe life into the image of that first beast that was wounded, looked like it was dead, came back to life. Will my husband and son still be my family in heaven? Will we all build a house together or live in separate houses? Now, I did not write that, but I do have a husband and son, so I don't... She's interested in the answer. Yes, I am. Well, I think that the Lord tells us we're gonna have freedom. We certainly will have that option. We've got some friends I will not name on national television that uh, she said, husband, I've been with you for 50 years now. When I get to heaven, I'm on my own. <laughs> so there'll be some that think that way. And then there'll be people who, you know, they just, they, they love their, their spouse as their best friend. And uh, they've got a great relationship and they're gonna wanna maybe spend time together in heaven. I think you've got about a billion years to think about it. So everyone's gonna be happy, I'll promise you that. You're wondering what my answer is? is, is like, <laughs> Wait and see. <laughs> no, no, it'd be a delight, dear, to be with you. Oh, thank you. If a day equals one year in prophecy, does that mean in the millennium that it will really be 365,000 years? Yeah, when you're studying prophecies, we've learned a day is a year, and so someone knowing the millennium is a thousand years, they said, well, that's a prophecy, and if a day equals a year, would that be 365,000 uh, years? Now, first of all, in the Jewish year, I alluded to this uh, in our presentation, maybe last night or the night before, when we talked about the millennium, that um, there's 360 days in the Jewish year. They, they were on a lunar calendar. They had 30 days to the month, mm -hmm. and that's why it says those 42 days of persecution in Revelation chapter 12, is adding up to 1,260 days or 1,260 years. Um, so once you get to the millennium, I believe that at that time we've entered eternity because the millennium begins with what? The coming of Christ. Christ. You're not using the prophetic time interpretation then. Uh, we've entered eternity. That thousand years will be a thousand years. Um, so uh, it's gonna be, I, now if I'm wrong and it's 360,000 years living and reigning with Christ, 
no complaints from me. <laughs> but I think that's a place where you would apply literal time. Another reason is because there have been literally about 6,000 years of human history in the world, according to the Bible. Not just according to the Bible, but even historians know you go back 5,000 years and all of a sudden uh, human history just goes quiet. It's amazing how evolutionists believe that men went from dragging their knuckles around to building pyramids in a few hundred years. Uh, and then you think about the mathematics and the genius in some of these great civilizations. We've been around the world and we've just seen some incredible things that were done by the ancient world and you think they were very intelligent to be able to build the way they built. Mm -hmm. um, and trees, you know, oldest trees you're gonna find here in California, mm -hmm. you get the bristle cone pine. Well, they date back to about 5,000 years. They got the Methuselah tree. It seems like so many things kind of reach a cliff and drop off in that period of time. So you got about 6,000 years of human history, and then we're gonna live and reign with Christ for 1,000 years, total of 7,000 years. It's like six days of work one day of rest, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. That's why I think we are living in the last generation. Not just because of that, but because Jesus said the gospel will go into all the world, then the end will come. Mm -hmm. Look at how the gospel, even a night like tonight, it's literally streaming around the world. We're getting letters and e emails from all over the world, from Muslim countries that mm -hmm. normally don't have freedom. And so for that reason, and a lot of other problems with the, the world right now. I think we're living in a generation where many of us sitting here could be alive when Jesus comes. And I'm very excited about that. Are there different types of prophecy or prophets? Good question. Uh, yes. You know, some of the prophecies were really of um, a nature where they were national. Um, you have some prophets who wrote books, some who didn't write books. John the Baptist, Jesus calls the greatest of the prophets. He didn't write a book. Elijah was a great prophet. He didn't write a book. But then you got, you know, Zechariah and Zephaniah and Obadiah, and they all wrote books. They're listed among the minor prophets. Some prophets, I think their, their uh, ministry was much broader. Moses was a prophet, but he was also serving as a priest, a mediator, a judge. He was a leader. Uh, so, you know, some of the prophets had uh, very broad roles. Some of them, they, their gift of prophecy was really restricted to what they wrote. Uh, some gave uh, apocalyptic prophets, like Daniel. We're going to look at a prophecy or a, a chapter in Daniel tonight. Uh, John in the book of Revelation, um, Ezekiel, Zechariah, those are more apocalyptic. They wrote their prophecies while they were occupied by other nations, and the prophecies are often given in interesting signs and symbols. And uh, so I think it's different spectrum of prophets and prophecies in the Bible. What is the difference between everlasting life in John 3.16 and everlasting fire in Matthew 25.41? Are both for all eternity? Yes, some people are saying that, um, well, Pastor Doug, you're telling us that the wicked don't burn forever in the fire. And if, there, if the word forever there doesn't mean forever, then how do we know eternal life is forever? And we're saying, no, the forever is forever. It says they are destroyed forever. They are burnt with eternal fire. The results of the fire are forever. And whenever you're in doubt, the apostles in the New Testament tell us, if you want to know about the destruction of the wicked, Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They were burnt up. They're not there anymore. They never have been. They never will be. Uh, their fate, their judgment was eternal. That's what's going to happen with the wicked. But the idea that they're going to consciously feel burning flame for unending ages for the sins of a brief lifetime, you just think about that. There's no way that adds up with justice. And of course, it doesn't add up with scripture, which is the reason that I believe what the Bible says on that subject. Mm -hmm. Thankful for that. When is the close of probation? You may hear the term close of probation, and I don't know that you're going to find a phrasing like that in the Bible, but um, an example of that would be when you read in the story of Noah. Noah builds the ark, spends 120 years building the ark. God says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, my spirit will not always strive with man, yet his days will be 120 years. So from the time that God called Noah and he began his construction project, 
He was also preaching not only with his hammer, but with his mouth. But the end is coming, inviting people to get on board. But eventually Noah went in, the animals went in, the Bible says the door was shut. But even after the door was shut, life went on for seven more days outside the ark. Sun was shining, the birds were singing, it looked like a beautiful day. But their destiny was sealed. Their probation had closed when the door closed. You'll read in Revelation 22 that when Jesus ceases his intercession for humanity and he stands up, you can read about when Michael stands up in Daniel chapter 12. It says, then there begins a time of trouble such as there never has been since there was a nation even unto the same time. Revelation 22. And when that happens, it says, he will declare, he that is just, let him be just still. He that is pure, let him pure, be pure and holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. The saved are saved. They're not going to be lost. The lost are lost and they cannot be saved. That's the close of probation. Right now, we have every reason to believe the door of mercy is still open, mm -hmm. but it's going to close someday. And that's why you don't want to wait until you see Jesus coming and think, I probably ought to repent of my sins. Mm -hmm. At that point, I'm quite certain it'll be too late. Too late. Yeah. Maybe they want to know when the close of probation is in regard to the seven last plagues. Yeah, well, I believe that uh, the Bible tells us that the seven last plagues begin to fall after the close of probation. Because that's happening, you know, when the mark of the beast, first he says you can't buy or sell. Ultimately, there's a death decree. And before that death decree is implemented, God is going to withdraw his spirit uh, from the lost. They uh, will have committed the unpardonable sin. You realize a world can commit the unpardonable sin. Mm -hmm. That's what happened in the days of Noah. Everybody outside the ark committed the unpardonable sin. Even though life went on for a little while, they could not be forgiven. They could not get in. So Jesus tells several parables. You know the story about the ten virgins. This is when he talks about the second coming. And he said the five foolish virgins, because they had not prepared and had extra oil, that the wedding guests went into the wedding. They went to buy. They came to the door. They pounded on the door. And they said, open to us. And he opened and he said, I'm sorry, I do not know you. And he closed the door. And they're in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so um, their probation had closed because they did not go in before the door was shut. Friends, if you hear Jesus knocking on the door of your heart, Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Now, you notice he says, I'm knocking, and he says, if you hear my voice. That means he's calling. Mm -hmm. He's knocking and he's calling. Today is the day if you hear him. Invite him into your heart. You don't know when that door is going to close. And that door can close for anybody at any time. Yeah. When your heart stops beating, it certainly closes then. Your destiny is sealed. So you want to give your life to the Lord now. Don't, follow, don't fall for the devil's most popular trip, trick of procrastination. Can you be an athlete while you're a Christian? Well, I believe so. You know, Paul talks about running the race in several of his parables. Um, yeah, there are probably some sports that you wonder if a, uh, a Christian can be involved in. You see some of these brutal combat sports where everyone's trying to bludgeon the other guy into unconsciousness, and I can't picture them saying, in the name of Jesus, and doing that. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of fun. Sometimes you'll see boxers kneel in the corner of the ring, and they cross themselves, and they go out and try and knock the guy out. Um, I, I, I find a moral dilemma in that. But, you know, then you've got stories like Eric Little, who is the missionary, and they made a movie about him called Chariots of Fire. He said, God made me fast, so I run. And, uh, but he just, he had a real heart for God. He would not run on what he believed was the Sabbath, Sunday. And God honored him for his convictions, and he ended up winning a race he hadn't even trained in. So there's a lot of Christians in sports, and you'll see him sometimes kneeling on the field and praying. I certainly wouldn't say that uh, you can't be a Christian and be involved in some kind of uh, professional athletics long as you're not compromising your convictions. Yeah, and the, and the Sabbath. Yeah. All right, our last question. Is gossip a sin? Well, gossip, yes. Uh, you know, when you talk about another person and they're not present, uh, you know, it's one thing if you're talking about someone and you're concerned and you're genuinely seeking solutions for how you might help them. But a lot of the discussion about other people is, um, you know, it, it's not healthy and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's always interesting to say, oh, have you heard so-and-so had a baby? And that's nothing wrong with anything like that. But when you begin to talk about people's problems and weaknesses and, 
and there's no, nothing constructive in what you're saying, that ends up descending into just gossip. And the Bible's pretty clear, those kind of tail bearers calls it a sin. And uh, Jesus said, uh, let nothing corrupt proceed from your mouth. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And uh, all of our speech should be seasoned with grace. And you've read in the book of James where it says the tongue, though it is small, it can set a real forest on fire. Sometimes by a few idle words, causes all kinds of misery. Wars have been fought mm -hmm. because of reckless words that have been spoken. Mm -hmm. So we pray that uh, God will help us to bridle what we speak. Amen? That Amen. it's controlled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for your questions. All right, we're really excited to have Jamie George with us tonight. This is his last night, but we've really enjoyed the music that he shared. And he is going to be playing Jesus, the very thought of, of thee. Thank you so much, Jamie. Sure appreciate that. Jesus, the very thought of thee. Well, friends, we have a very important lesson tonight. I want to welcome you to the Panorama of Prophecy. Again, tonight is going to be a practical lesson, but it's also a lesson found in the book of Daniel, which is a book of prophecy. And I think you're going to find this encouraging. 
Uh, keep in mind that some of the best is yet to come. Uh, tonight, we are having a meeting. Of course, there's a night off tomorrow night. And then when's our next meeting? Friday night. At 7 p.m. we'll be here. Also, we'll be having a meeting Saturday morning. Now, if you want to come a little early, there's a Bible study that begins at 10 o'clock, and then our meeting begins at 11 o'clock and goes to 1230. Same format that we've been having during the Panorama of Prophecy programs. Then again, Saturday night, Sunday night, we're entering the final week where we're dealing with some of these just amazing prophecy subjects, talking about the last days. A lot of folks keep saying, Pastor Doug, when are you going to get into the just real meat? We've been laying the foundation uh, up till now to help prepare people. Uh, we wanted to make sure you've got a relationship with Jesus because that's the most important thing. Amen? Well, tonight, we're going to be talking about the subject of refusing Babylon's buffet. And if you have your Bibles, you want to go to the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is a book filled with apocalyptic prophecies. We've got that prophecy in chapter 2 of the metal image. You've got the prophecy in chapter 7 we're going to be talking about. We've got the four beasts. Chapter 8 where you've got the ram and the goat. Chapter 9 where you've got the dates concerning the Messiah's return. And then it's a, one of the longest prophecies in the Bible. Reaches from Daniel chapter 10 through Daniel chapter 12. And where it talks about the abomination of desolation. But it's very interesting that the first chapter in the book of Daniel is dealing with one of the keys to understanding all prophecy. It has to do with self-control, wisdom, mental clarity, and your lifestyle. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Daniel chapter 1. And it tells us that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles from the house of God that he carried into the land of Sinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles from into the treasure house of his God. First thing I want you to notice about the book of Daniel, it is a battle between two gods and two kingdoms. All through the book of Daniel, it's talking about the gods of the world and the king of kings and who's going to ultimately win in this battle. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants. Actually, some of these are descendants from Hezekiah. And there had been a prophecy made by Isaiah to Hezekiah saying some of your descendants will be brought to the palace of Babylon and be eunuchs serving the king. This was literally fulfilled in the book of Daniel. Some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles and young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies from the king's cafeteria. They would be fed as they studied in the king's university to serve as advisors and wise men. He said, we're going to get the brightest and the best. Now, from among those were the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave the name to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, Bel and Belteshazzar, then to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. Daniel was faced with a little moral conundrum. He said, I'm thankful that uh, of those who are carried away captive, we're going to be having comfortable quarters somewhere in the king's barracks. We'll be in this uh, Babylonian university. I'm thankful they're offering to feed us. They're not torturing us. That we'll be able to serve in the, this capacity. But they want us to eat things according to the word of God we are not supposed to eat and drink things according to the word of God we are not supposed to drink that the Bible says will defile us. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not be defiled with these things. And so, of course, this story found in Daniel chapter 1 sets the stage for why Daniel was who he was through the rest of the book. It's very interesting. You can read there in Daniel 1.8, Daniel, and it's assumed that this is also true of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They purposed in, it says, he purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the kings, the delicacies, what they had on the menu there in Babylon, said, we can't eat it. 
It included some food that was unclean and no doubt had been offered to Babylonian idols. And so he came up with a, uh, Daniel was very wise, came up with a solution and he suggested to the prince of the eunuchs, said, um, test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Put us on a vegetarian diet for 10 days. I know uh, Rick Warren, pastor in Southern California, uh, made national news by encouraging his church to follow the Daniel diet. And I forget what it was, but the whole congregation together lost like, you know, 50 tons. It was interesting what they did, but um, this was a, a simple diet. Basically, it's a vegetarian diet. And so at first, the prince of the eunuchs says, I can't do that because my job is to keep you healthy and you're going to have to eat the good Babylonian food if you want to be healthy. How can you be healthy e eating vegetables and pulse and beans and drinking water? They've got the idea that somehow that the exotic food is going to be the healthiest food, but that's not true. I grew up living with, uh, and my father was very wealthy. Sometimes he'd take us out to nice restaurants and we'd order escargot, snails, frog legs, turtle steak, and they're supposed to be the delicacies. And then when I was poor and I lived up in the mountains, I ate beans and rice and fruit, I had no refrigeration. I felt much better eating the poor man's diet. You know, in some of the countries, when they eat a very simple diet of beans and rice and things like that, they live much longer, they have less disease, less cancer. Then they're converted to the Western diet, a lot of fat and sugar and processed food, and the heart disease and the cancer just skyrockets. So notice what happens after Daniel convincing the prince of the eunuchs. He said, give us 10 days to try this diet out. And it says, at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, I don't want to be fatter in flesh. What that means is they had just, you know, made a grueling trip across the desert to come to Babylon, and they were probably worn thin, and they were able to fill out. They had elasticity in their step, and they had spunk in the trunk and pep in the step and, and zip in the hip, and, and they just looked like they were in good shape. And they looked much better than all of the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. You could visibly see a difference. Not only was there a visible difference after just 10 days of eating this diet, but it says in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them 10 times better than all of the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. 10 times wiser, these young men. Notice the connection between their perceptions, their intelligence, and their diet that is being made. So why are we talking about this as we delve into deep prophecies? Because clarity of mind is actually going to help in your understanding. The devil is trying to befuddle this whole generation in the world with, with drugs and dissipation and bad diets. We just don't think straight. And it affects our understanding. It affects every aspect of our life and our relationships. And that's why this is the first chapter that you find in the book of Daniel. It's a lesson on self-control, giving glory to God with your body. And tells us that uh, not only did they live 10 times longer, you read on in that chapter, it says Daniel lived until the time of King Cyrus, meaning Daniel lived about 100 years. So he not only was sharp, and even you get into Daniel chapter 6, and he's already at chapter 5, he's an old man, and he's still brilliant at that time. And God is still speaking through him. So we're going to find out what does the Bible say about how you can have a more abundant life, a longer life, a healthier life, a clearer mind. But before we go to the lesson and those things, we're going to go to the street and find out what our men and women on the street have to say about this. The Bible says the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we hold Jesus in our hearts. We hold Jesus in our soul and Jesus in our, in our spirit. You don't like mess it up with drugs or too much alcohol. Too much of anything is bad. You know, that vessel, you want to you wanna keep it, you know, as functioning as possible. Like it's a temple, you don't want to trash your body. Don't drink too much and don't smoke. So it's not just the way that you dress, but it's the words that you speak. It's the way that you treat people. It's the way that you live life. Um, it should definitely be a reflection. And so people will know that the Holy Spirit resides in you. Um, I believe that what we put into our bodies obviously fuels it and could propel it to either health or unhealth, sick, sickness. 
Um, so yeah, I do think that what you eat is important. Eating well, working out, that can be really good for your longevity. As far as if you want to eat lobster or not, things like that, I don't think there's any judgment necessarily for that. But are there things that are good for you and things that are bad for you? Yes. Alcohol um, without moderation, um, because that, that alters our mind and t typically causes us to fall. <laughs> not to my knowledge. Maybe, I, I think some, some kind of meat, uh, how's that called? The resurrection, uh, you know, the Easter? That's, that's when you, you can eat uh, red meat, right? If, if the Lord is casting demons into it, why eat it? Don't eat it. Just, just, it, it's, it's, just don't eat it. it. It's obviously unhealthy. It's very good. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that last young man, he was talking about uh, when Jesus cast all of the swine, all the demons into a herd of swine. He said, well, if it's got swine cast, or demons cast into it, you don't want to eat it. I'd never heard that reasoning before. Let's find out what the Bible says about how to take care of our bodies so that we could have a longer, stronger, more abundant life. And, you know, friends, when I began to learn these things, it just changed my life, and I am just so thankful that we have a chance to share this with you. We're going to have fun tonight. You want to know what the Bible says, amen? And I think you're going to be blessed by this. First of all, question number one, what was the original diet that God designed for humans? You read the answer there right in the first chapter of the Bible. It says in Genesis 1, uh, verse 29, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. The original diet for man was fruits and nuts and maybe beans. But uh, in the beginning, man was certainly a vegetarian, and during that time, his lifespan was measured in centuries. This was the original diet for man. And um, now, you might be saying, Pastor Doug, you're telling us that we've got to be vegetarians. Let me set the record straight. No, I'm not telling you that. I'm saying this is where we came from, and this is where we're going in heaven. This is God's original plan. And since God designed our bodies, he knows that this is the best diet for the human body. And science now is backing that up. Question two. After Adam and Eve sinned, what supplemental food did God add to their diets? You read in Genesis 3, and this is following sin, man could no longer eat from the tree of life. He said, and you will eat the herb of the field. That is better known as what? Vegetables. In other words, at first it's just the fruits and the grains, the, um, um, you know, water, of course, nuts, and then he adds vegetables. Now, do you know the difference between a fruit and a vegetable? Let me do a little quiz with you real quick. Apple? Fruit. Potato? Vegetable. Tomato? They sound alike, potato, tomato, but they're different, huh? Zucchini? Well, I heard both there. Zucchini is a fruit. Eggplant? Fruit. Yeah. Brussels sprouts? Unedible. <laughs> So you get the idea. Anything that is the product of the blossom is a, a fruit. Uh, any part of the plant, whether it's a tuber like a potato, and then you get you know, the carrots or the root or the stalk or the leaves, that's part of the vegetation. That's a vegetable. And so then God added vegetables. I know a lot of kids are really sorry God added vegetables to man's diet. But this was the original diet for man, and man was originally um, a vegetarian. And it's been proven, and a lot of athletes have also discovered that um, in that diet, you're going to have less disease, less cancers, your, your life will be longer. I mean, the jury is in. How many of you have heard of the National Geographic study that they did? It was in the cover of their magazine called the Blue Zones, the Blue Zones. They wanted to find out these are areas of the world where people live unusually long, much longer than average. And they did some research and went around the world, looked at the lifespans, looked at the lifestyles of people that were living a long time, trying to evaluate why do they live so long. And they found that, uh, I think, three, I remember three out of four of the principal areas. They had um, Sardinia in the Mediterranean. People live a very long time. They had people in Okinawa that live a very long time. And then they had Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California. They live a very long time. That was one of the groups. And they said part of it is, of course, their, their lifestyle, 
They, are, uh, they support a vegetarian diet. The rest of the Sabbath helps prolong their life. The community of church. Do you know that married men live longer than unmarried men? Now, I'm not trying to make the unmarried men worry. I'm just telling you that it's a statistic, that there's something about it when you've got the social bonding or if you feel like someone else needs you, people tend to live as long as they're needed. If they feel like they're not needed, it doesn't contribute to good health. But uh, they had a lot of studies that... Uh, some of you maybe heard of a book that was ri written by... Was it Hilton? It was called Lost Horizon. You, how many of you have heard of Shangri-La? Shangri-La is first mentioned in this book. He actually went to a place in India and the, the people that live in the Hunza Valleys in India, the book is based upon that, the book is fiction, talks about people that live hundreds of years, but the people in the Hunza Valley did live uh, much longer than average, and they were up there where there's clean water, fresh air, they work outside, they get exercise, and um, they eat largely a vegetarian diet. They were apricot farmers, and so he wrote this book about this secret valley where people live a long time. But the jury is in. It is a fact that if you follow the biblical principles of health that you find in the Word of God, you can avoid a lot of disease. Now, I, I know that some of this is genetics. And someone said one of the most important things you can do to increase your health is choose your ancestors very carefully. Because there's some things you just, you can inherit. But you don't have to have the same results as your ancestors even though you may have inherited bad genetics, that was maybe combined with a bad lifestyle. One reason I got real excited about this is, uh, any of you remember Jack LaLanne? He had the first aerobic exercise program on television. And uh, a, a short man, when he was a boy, his father died when he was very young from a heart attack. I don't know, he was late 40s or something. And he later learned it was from the lifestyle. And he went to a lecture and he saw a man that was 60 years old doing back handsprings across the stage. He was promoting a vegetarian diet. And Jack LaLanne said, I don't want to die young. And he committed himself to health. He ended up living in his, into his 90s. He signed one of his books and he saw our TV program. He, he signed one of his books and sent it to me. He said, Doug, thinking of you healthfully. And, uh, when he was like 75 years old, he pulled 75 kids across San Francisco Bay in a boat by himself. I mean, he just he had incredible health. But he learned that in spite of the genetics of his family, by changing his lifestyle, he could prolong his life. So original diet, vegetarian diet. Here's an amazing fact for you. A few years ago, Jeanette and Alan Murray from Australia, Jeanette had... Uh, survived cancer, and she thinks one reason she had survived breast cancer is because she had turned to a vegetarian and a vegan diet, and they wanted to promote that. So she and her husband, Alan, decided to do a marathon around Australia. And they ran 365 marathons a day consecutively without missing a day. They went 11,000 miles completely around the country of Australia. They consumed, I think, 22,000 bananas. I forget. Uh, lots of vegetables, lots of fruit. They had a support crew that would meet them along the way. They'd start early, so it wouldn't be too hot. Then they went to Tasmania. They ran around Tasmania. They ended up running consecutively 366 marathons in a row, making it to the Guinness Book of World Records. And the interesting thing is Jeanette was 63, and he was 68 at the time they did this. Vegetarians. People say, oh, vegetarians can't be healthy. You don't get enough protein. You don't get enough vitamin B. Those are myths. That's totally not true. I, I personally have been a vegetarian for 40 years now. Unless somebody snuck something to me in a potluck I don't know about. That's probably happened. I got something in takeout the other day. I had to spit it out because I wasn't sure exactly what it was. <laughs> but, uh, and it just prolongs your life. You have a lot less disease. You feel much better. So is God concerned with our physical health? What does the Bible say? Did Jesus, is it just spiritual things? Or is it physical also? You read in Matthew 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Did Jesus want people to be sick and diseased? 
No, he spent so much time healing these things. You can read here, it says in 3 John, uh, uh, chapter, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, he's telling us that not only do I want your soul to prosper, I want you to prosper and be in health. Now, the Apostle Paul said, you know, it's true that bodily exercise is not going to save your soul. The most important thing is that you are spiritually healthy, but that doesn't discount the importance of bodily exercise and health. Another little amazing fact, the Williams sister, Venus and Serena, I believe it was uh, Venus who had an autoimmune deficiency and she had to get out of her uh, tennis plane for a while. She found that the best results came from turning to a vegan and a vegetarian diet. And it showed such dramatic improvement that her sister Serena also adopted it. And especially when they're training, they're very strict about it. And they have won more titles than any other pair of women in tennis in history. They're also in the Guinness Book of World Records. And I can go through a number of athletes, uh, triathlon people, Carl Lewis, and, and then they're learning that the human body functions better with uh, the diet that God designed. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I typically, before I go to the office, Karen, she usually has a little bucket of grapes for me or some fruit. I'll dice up an apple and I'll eat a handful of nuts. And uh, boy, that just holds me. My head is clear. I feel great. And I can make it until one o'clock just on that. That's Adam and Eve, fruits, greens, and nuts. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You got fruits, if you got strawberry preserves, fruits, greens, and nuts. All your basic food groups. You got your protein. Everything's in there. And uh, you feel great. No, as long as it's not too much sugar. Oh, I didn't ever read the verse. John 10:10. 10, 10. Christ said, I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. God wants you to have an abundant life. God promised the children of Israel that if they would serve and obey him, he'd remove all sickness. Did he keep his promise? He did. You read in Psalm 105, verse 37, he brought them out and there was none feeble person, not one sick person among his tribes. Tells us they had about 600,000 men in the army. So if you got 600,000 fighting men, and then you figure that there's some younger men and older men, and you got the women and you got the kids, you've got at least 2 million people. Can you imagine 2 million people and not one clinic, and the doctor's just sitting there all day tapping his foot with nothing to do? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, they spent 40 years following God's plan, drinking the water from the rock and eating the bread from heaven, and he did give them occasional quail that would come in, but following the diet of God, they ended up, they were getting exercise. You know, there's a, a world-famous institute, they're friends of ours, just up the hill called Weimar Institute. Have some of you heard of Weimar Institute? And they're famous for an acronym called New Start. And each letter in that acronym, New Start, represents one of the biblical principles for health. Things like nutrition and exercise and water and sunlight, ST, and uh, temperance, A, air, R, rest, T, trust, and divine power. I had to talk it out to myself to remember what they were. But you follow those things, fresh air, exercise, sunlight, water, um, trust in divine power, and you know what, you follow that program. People come from around the world to go to that institute to recover their health by following those principles. And they're in the Bible. It's Bible teachings. When they came out, there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Why is our health so important to God? We heard this come up in our questions with the people on the street. It says in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, how many of you are hoping that God is going to give you a new body when Jesus comes? Anybody? You don't care so much when you're young. But yet you to be my age, you start thinking, that sounds pretty attractive to me. I'd like to trade this in on a newer model. Anyone else? All right, suppose that you're my friend and uh, you're going to take a vacation in Mexico and you say, Pastor Doug, can I borrow your pickup truck? And I got, the pickup truck's only a few years old. And they say, all right, yeah. And you take the truck. You're gone for three weeks. You don't tell me you're going to race the Baja 100. And you come limping back after a few weeks, and I can hear you coming. This is terrible knocking noise. It's coming from what used to be my engine. And as you drive up, one of the doors is falling off, windshield's broken, 
headlights hanging out, smoke's coming out from under the hood. You're making a terrible squealing noise because the tires are worn off and you're driving on the rims. You ever seen that before? Sparks are flying out everywhere. And you come out and you jump out and you hand me the keys and say, thanks so much, Doug. I really appreciate it. Had a great trip. Can I borrow it again in a month? Am I going to lend you my truck? I can't afford to fix it anyway. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Christ owns you because he is your creator. He owns you because he is your redeemer. And we will give an account to God for what we do with the bodies that he's given us. If we're saying, Lord, we want you to give us a new body and we're not caring for the one that we've got, well, why would you think that he'd trust you with a glorified eternal body? Now, some of you didn't know these things and you're already suffering the results of bad life choice decisions. God will forgive you. But you want to start where you're at now and start taking care of your body. Amen? This is something you don't hear Christians talk about very often, but it's in the Bible. I'm going to show you some more verses here. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. He doesn't want a dead one. He wants a living, healthy sacrifice. Holy. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable for you to do that. Say, Lord, take my body. Take my health. Now, why do you want to take care of your health? Not just for you. What's the great commandment? Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. I want to take care of my body because I love God and I want to serve God. I can serve him better if I'm in good health. Does that make sense? I want to take care of my body because I love my neighbor and I want to serve my fellow man. I can serve my fellow man better if I'm in good health. We're doing these programs and plus I've got my other work that I do and it's rather demanding and I just know that every day I've got to get some exercise. I've got to make sure I get rest. I eat very carefully. I've just eaten twice today. Uh, if you eat too much, you get a food coma just before you preach, and that doesn't work. And so, I, I, out of love for you, out of love for God, I try to take care of myself. Isn't that the reason to do it, first of all? It's because of love. But I think everybody also likes that you also want to feel better because you want to feel better. What's a good Bible rule for healthful living? Therefore, whether you eat or whether you drink, do all for the glory of God. Now, if it tells us to eat and drink for God's glory, is it possible for us to not eat and drink for God's glory? Does that make sense? Yeah, so certainly it is possible. Um, you know, friends, I think just it, it is so critical for us to understand the brain. You know why God gives you legs? Carry your brain around. Even with modern computers today, for them to build a computer that will do what the human mind does, you would need a building as big as the Pentagon to house it. You need all the water of Niagara Falls to power it. You would need all of the water of Niagara Falls to cool it. The fastest computers they've got in the world now, it goes back and forth between the US and China. I think Korea's striving for the fastest computer in the world. They cannot do what a mouse brain does yet. You know how much processing is going on in your mind even as we sit here right now? You're taking these sound waves that are going through the air. I'm trying to make some logical sense out of it and you're converting this into abstract thought and your brain is keeping your heart beating and you're, it's controlling your respiration. You don't know that it might even be controlling your temperature at this time. And then all the little hairs on your body are connected with your brain and you're sensing anything that might be going on. You're hearing noises that behind you and you're processing those. And all of this is happening at lightning speed right now as we speak. Your, your brain is a strange combination of a physical organ and a spiritual thing. And God communicates with us through our minds. But because it's also physical, taking care of your body, which houses your brain and follows the commands of the brain, it affects your clarity. It affects how clear it is, how easy it is for God to speak to you. If we're not following good practical principles for good health, our minds get cloudy and it's hard for us to comprehend spiritual truth. And it's a truth that sets you free. I don't think it's an accident that the first chapter in this book of Daniel is talking to us about health practices. So with these things in mind, and we're talking about glorifying God in our bodies, 
Question number seven. Should a Christian use alcoholic beverages? Now, we're not talking about grape juice now. We're talking about the fermented stuff. What does the Bible say? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. Whoever is led astray thereby is not wise. Now, how many want to be wise? If we're led astray with it, then we're not wise. The Bible tells us that Noah drank, and he stumbled around drunk in his tent, and one of his family members ended up being cursed as a result of that. Lot's daughters got him to drink alcohol, and he committed incest with his daughters. Whole race of people, the Moabites and Ammonites, came around that attacked God's people for centuries because he got drunk. King David tried to get Uriah drunk so he would go against his conscience. And you could just go through the history. The Bible says, woe to him who gives his neighbor drink. Because what's happening is everyone knows that your response time is impaired by alcohol. Alcohol is an addictive drug. It destroys brain cells, not once, but every time you drink. It's destroying brain cells. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford to lose any more than I've already lost. It dramatically affects our ability to reason. You know, I'm really passionate about this because um, my father struggled with alcohol. And it affected our relationship. People drink, they say things, they later regret. They stumble around, they do silly things. My mother drank. I drank when I was younger. You wake up in prison and you think, how in the world did I get here? What did I do? You're embarrassed about uh, silly things that you've done and terrible things that you said. Um, it doesn't make you more intelligent. Now, I know. I used to drink. It gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. You can, it says, give a wine to him who is ready to perish. On the cross, they offered Jesus wine. He tasted it and he turned away. He did not want his mind to be clouded, especially as our eternity hangs in the balance. He didn't want to say anything that would give the devil the advantage because his mind was no longer clear. Christians should not drink. Half of the people that go to the hospital every day are there because of sickness, birth defects, injuries, accidents caused by alcohol. Over half the people who are in prison are there because of crimes committed while under the influence of alcohol. Over half of all the calls the police get, especially where there's domestic abuse involved, alcohol is connected. Now, just with those facts, to what extent should Christians support that? When one out of seven people who drinks becomes an alcoholic, how much would you support that? Should you support a dog that bites one out of seven people that comes to your house? You see what I'm saying? And so, and you might wonder why I'm coming on so strong, and many who are watching and listening, you come from a Christian background, but you think, well, you know, didn't Paul say drink a little wine for your stomach's infirmities? He's talking to Timothy. The word there, wine, meant grape juice. Jesus did not make booze for the wedding doesn't talk about anyone being inebriated in those events. And it's the same word that is used for the fermented alcohol that you find other places in the Bible. So people get confused sometimes. You can look in Isaiah where it says, as the new wine, same word, wine, is in the cluster. Well, when grape juice is in a cluster, is it uh, fermented? Clearly not. And Jesus said his gospel was new wine. It says you don't put the new wine in the old wineskins or it'll ferment and they'll burst and you lose everything. You put new wine in new wineskins to keep it fresh as long as possible. And so, uh, friends, it's, it's a, of all my friends, now let me just, I'll be very honest with you. The old Doug Bachelor, before I was converted, I drank alcohol, I smoked pot. I used to drink with my mom and dad, you know, they let us drink when we were kids. Uh, I used to go around and empty my father's martini glasses when I was like six years old. And so I started too young. Smoke cigarettes, cocaine, LSD, hashish, quaaludes, uh, phenobarbital. I mean, I, I, I used all kinds of different drugs. I hesitate telling you that because you're going to think, that's why he gets these prophetic interpretations, since he's having flashbacks. But no, I, I've cleared up from that. It's been a long time. But I lost more friends from alcohol than all of those other drugs put together. And so when a Christian says, oh, a little bit's good, I used to pastor a church of Navajo Indians. And I'm not trying to be derogatory. My Navajo friends that might be watching right now will agree what I'm about to tell you. My uncle ran a Navajo trading post for 50 years. He said he never met a Navajo, something in their biology that they just had no resistance to alcohol. If they drank, they would become alcoholics. 
So they always drank until they were out of alcohol, out of money, or passed out. Now with that in mind, I used to pastor a Navajo church. If I could control it and I drank one glass of wine a week moderately, I could say I drink moderately, temperately. But my church members would say Pastor Doug drinks and they'd be right. They would try to do it moderately, they can't. So Paul tells us, do not do anything that might make your brother stumble if you love your brother. And it's not like we live in a society today where I'm dying of thirst, there's nothing to drink. You go to the typical 7-Eleven, there's 500 things you can drink that don't have alcohol, right? Or the supermarket. So I know I spent some time writing this because it's a problem in the world and in our culture. And uh, I'll, I'll wait to another question, I'll say that. Number eight. What will God do to those who defile their bodies? Is this serious? I didn't write this book. This was written by Paul. He said, do you not know that you are the temple of God? It's the holiest building in the world. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. Remember why Daniel would not eat that uh, forbidden food from Babylon's buffet? He said, I, he purposed in his heart he would not defile himself. You belong to God. And if we defile our bodies with these things, Jesus said, look, you're not treating your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to take care of our bodies. The Bible says, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, right? So if you've got some poison, and you know this is poison, and it's going to kill you in uh, one hour, and you take it, what do they call that? Suicide. Right? Is that a sin? The Bible says, thou shalt not kill. That would include yourself. Does everyone know that? God doesn't support self-murder. What if you read on the bottle, this is poison, it's going to kill you in a week, and you take it? Is that still a sin? What if you read on the bottle, this is going to kill you in five years? Is it still suicide? You see where I'm going with this? Some of us are doing stuff we know is going to shorten our lives, and God wants you to live a full, abundant life, and it says, Thou shalt not kill, even if you're doing it slowly. With that in mind, tobacco is the second most costly drug addiction in North America, and, you know, if you drink wine, you may actually get some vitamins. Smoking a cigarette, you get no nutritional value. As a matter of fact, your money goes up in smoke, so to speak. They say that if you smoke, you're a real sucker. <laughs> That's a play on words. Because it just, it, you spend money, it's addictive, it, all you get is a buzz, and it doesn't last, and it ends up destroying your health. And I understand, friends, some of you here I know are struggling, many of you are watching, I'm sure you're struggling with it. I'm telling you, you can get the victory. The Lord did it for me. My father smoked for 50 years, and he quit. My grandfather smoked, I think I told you, for 50 years, and he lived in 93. And the Lord, your Savior, is bigger than your devil. He can save you from any addiction. But you've got to make up your mind you want to be free and ask him for help, and he will help you. You know, and I'm always amazed that smoking was able to take off and catch hold. I just can't picture Sir Walter Raleigh coming back to Europe, and he unfolds all these dignitaries are in the palace. He said, let me show you what I found in the New World. And he pulls out these leaves. Think, Ooh, what is it? Tobacco. What do you do? Well, you roll it up, set it on fire, you inhale the smoke, and it makes you dizzy. Oh, wow, it took off. Gave everybody that, that, that happy buzz for a little bit, but you know you end up needing more and more, and then pretty soon it's not the happy buzz. You're chain smoking, you're coughing, you can't breathe, and you're using up all your money. Nobody wants to kiss you anymore. What mammals? Now, God talks about diet in the Bible. When we're going into foods, we talked about the original ideal diet is going to be fruits, grains, nuts, vegetables, so forth, beans. But um, what about meat? Does God say that you can eat meat? Yes. It's not the ideal, but the Bible does say you can eat it. Which animals did he say that were permitted to eat? It tells us in Leviticus 11, verse 3. Whatever divides the hoof, having the cloven hoof, the split hoof, and chewing the cud, it needed both categories. And this would be things like the cow 
and the goat and the sheep and the deer. But there are some animals that uh, had a cloven hoof but that doesn't chew the cud like a camel. They're unclean. I know some of you are going to have to go home and take the camel steak out of your refrigerator. Remember what Jesus said? The scribes and the Pharisees, he said, you're hypocrites because you strain your water so that you will not swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. You strain a gnat and you swallow a camel. And he said, you're being hypocrites. They were not supposed to eat camel. But there's also another mammal that's got a cloven hoof and it does not chew the cud. And it's what? It's a pork, the pig. The Bible says that's unclean and that's what often troubles people. We'll get to that in just a moment. What about these sea creatures? What does God say in his word are safe to eat of those things that are in the sea? What fish and seafood are clean? Leviticus 11, verse 9. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever is in the water that has fins and scales, that you may eat. And um, so I needed these two categories together. Fins and scales. I heard that um, the Navy years ago wanted to have a survival book for its sailors if they were you know, stranded, a ship went down, and they're on a lifeboat, and they want to know what sea creatures they could eat. Some are poisonous. And so they did a bunch of research using your tax dollars, and after years of research, they came up with the rule. They said, if it's got fins and scales, it's probably safe. And they ended up saying what the Bible said. But it goes on to say in Leviticus 11, verse 10, but all that are in the seas and in the rivers that do not have fins and scales that move in the waters, or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. Now, that would mean oysters. You realize that they're on the bottom. They're called bottom feeders. They clean the water. I think we had one president that died from eating contaminated shellfish. Lobsters, shrimp. I used to love, I used to catch lobster and shrimp cocktail, and one of the few animals that served with the digestinal tract still in it. And it can be very toxic. God does not want us eating those things. And even if you didn't know what the medical reasons were, it should be enough that God says, don't do it. It's not like there's nothing else to eat. What about the birds? Does God have a category for them? It doesn't have a simple rule like the cloven hoof and chewing the cut or the fins and the scales. But as you look at the different birds, probably the best rule of thumb is the foraging birds were safe to eat. Those are the birds like the chicken, the um, Bible says the dove and the quail, the grouse, they go around, the turkey, they peck the seeds, and they're the, the foraging birds like that. The birds of carrion and the other birds were declared unclean. And here it says, Leviticus 11, 15 and 16, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull, and the hawk after its kind, they are unclean. You're not supposed to eat owls and buzzards. Someone's going to write down, what about duck? Well, duck are in the swan category, and it says in the Bible, they are unclean also. And I even know Jewish friends that eat duck, but technically they would be unclean. Are the laws about the clean and the unclean animals part of Moses' ceremonial law that ended at the cross? Some people are saying, oh, Doug, those are the laws of the Jews. Those are health laws for the Jews. The distinction between clean and unclean animals, that's a Jewish law. It was nailed to the cross. Is a Jewish stomach different from anyone else's stomach? No. And by the way, the typical Jewish lifespan of the Orthodox Jews is among the oldest. So there must be something to some of it. Was Noah Jewish? It's not a trick question, no. Anyone here related to Noah? Everybody, I hope, <laughs> or you're an alien. The Bible tells us that Noah made a distinction between the clean and the unclean. Genesis 7, verse 1 and 2. Come into the ark, you and all your household, and you shall take with you seven of each, every clean animal, the male and its female. Two of each animal that are unclean, a male and its female. Now, one reason for that was he also offered the clean animals as sacrifice. You're never supposed to offer an unclean animal. One of the greatest insults that you could ever offer God was to, like, bring a, a pig or a skunk or a vulture into the temple and say, I brought you a sacrifice. You're only supposed to bring a clean animal as a sacrifice. Those animals could also be eaten. Well, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not supposed to bring the unclean things into that temple. And pork is, um, it is a salt-laden, carcinogenic thing. 
Pork, some people say, oh, I eat the white meat. Pork is not a white meat. When it talks about white meat, it's talking about fish and chicken or turkey or something like that. Uh, I used to have my own meat business. I don't have the picture on the screen anymore, but I had a business called Doug Bachelor's Wholesale Prime Beef Steaks. And I used to buy sections of beef and butcher them, and then I'd sell them. During that time, when I was living in the mountains in the cave, I ate beans and rice, and I felt great. Not long after that, I got the job butchering and selling meat, and um, I was eating sirloin steak and eggs for breakfast and T-bone for dinner and New York steak for lunch. And I mean, I was eating meat three times a day because I had all these prime cuts, and I didn't feel very good. And um, I know too much of anything's not good. But I went to a friend one day because a customer said, can you get me some prime pork? And my butcher friend, he laughed. He said, you can't get prime pork. He said, the US Department of Agriculture, they don't grade pork that way. They print leaflets to tell you to cook it good or you're going to get trichina. And so that was never supposed to be part of man's diet. Now, with Noah, we were just talking about Noah a minute ago. I want you to notice, here's an old chart I saw that looks at the, the, the altitude or the height of Noah, Seth, Methuselah. 950 years, 969 years, 912 years. Then after the flood, look at what happened to man's lifespan. Went down to 600, 500, 200 very quickly. But you know what else happened after the flood? Man largely went from a vegetarian diet. All the vegetation had been destroyed in the world. They began to eat some of the clean animals that they had taken in multiples on the ark. And meat became a more regular part of man's diet. Their lifespan went radically down. Galatians 6, verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. The Lord loves you. He knows it's a struggle, but if you don't make those healthy changes in your diet, you will reap the results. If you are sowing cholesterol, you're going to reap a stroke or heart attack or cancer, one of those things. And so it does make a difference. By the way, do you know, you don't get cholesterol from plant foods. When they give me the peanuts on the plane, it says cholesterol free. I think, well, duh. I mean, <laughs> does God say that eating unclean food is a serious offense? Behold, the Lord will come with fire. This is Isaiah 66, verse 15 and verse 17. The Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to those who sanctify themselves, eating swine's flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together. Wow, that's pretty clear. Now, he's, he's not just talking about Jews that break some Jewish law. He's talking about his second coming. And it's the people that are defiling their body temples. And he puts the abomination and mouse in the same category with swine's flesh. And uh, no one out there is eating mouse burgers, I'm hoping. There are some places where they're, they're eating dogs still in different parts of the world. But uh, God did not intend for us to eat pigs. I used to take care of pigs for my neighbor, and I always struggled to find some new way to describe pigs. And what I come up with is, you know, pigs are pigs. They're not clean. That's one thing if you had a pet pig, you can have a pet dog. They're in the same category. You want to eat your dog, I hope. They're smart, but they're scavengers. The Bible says, do not give what is holy unto the dogs. Do not cast your pearls before swine as the dog returns to his vomit and the pig to wallowing in the mire. The dog and the pig are always bunched together as the unclean scavengers in the Bible. You can have nice pet dogs, but you're not supposed to eat them. The Bible says it's an abomination. You know, Jews around the world, even Muslims know this. It's a basic Bible teaching. It's not just for the Jews. What about Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10? Let's go here real quick. Peter, I don't know if I have time to read the whole thing. Peter is invited to go to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. Before he goes, he's on his roof praying, and he's hungry. And while he's on his roof praying, he goes into a trance. He sees this vision. And this sheet held together at the four corners is lowered from the heavens. And in this big sheet, think of like a circus tent sheet, it's full of all these unclean animals. And he hears a voice from heaven saying, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter responds and says, not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. It's all in Acts chapter 10. Peter says, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. This is years after Jesus died. If Jesus had been teaching you can eat anything, Peter would have been eating other things. 
It says, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Three times the sheet comes down. Three times Peter says, not so, Lord. He thinks it's a test. He says, I'm going with your word. And then the sheet goes up, and Peter's wondering, what does this mean? There's a knock on the door. The Gentiles are inviting Peter to come and to preach to them. But a Jew was not supposed to go into the home of a Gentile and not supposed to eat with them. And God says, go with them, trusting me. Later, Peter, recounting the story, he says, Acts chapter 10, 28, God has shown me that I should not call any pig unclean, any man unclean. The purpose of the vision had nothing to do with food articles. God was telling the Jews, you can now go to the Gentiles. Do not call the Gentiles unclean. That was the reason of the vision. He used the metaphors and the, the pictures that a Jew would understand. But the Lord is still clear that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He did not take away the health laws. He still wants us to care about our health. What is a good basic health rule for Christians? And it says, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Not only should we completely abstain from the things that are bad, but we should be temperate in the things that are good. It's kind of like just using the traffic lights. What does a red light mean? Stop. You were slow on that answer. Green light? Go. Yellow light? Go real fast. <laughs> Yellow light means caution, right? So if I was to say to you, bananas, green light. Apples, green light. Almonds, green light, right? If I was to say pigs, red light. Chicken, yellow light. And I went to a chicken slaughterhouse at a summer camp one year. Long before I read the Bible, I got the victory over that. I don't know why they took me there. It just it left me where I needed therapy after that. So be temperate even in the things that are permissible. You don't want to overdo anything, right? Number 15, are the Bible health principles still practical today? Answers? I'm going to go through just some of these very quickly. And by the way, these answers that you're going to see, I, these, this lesson was written before the pandemic. <laughs> I just want you to know that this is not some, some kind of statement on what's happening in the world today. A, quarantine procedures control contagious disease. Church leaders in Europe during the bubonic plague finally turned to the Bible and figured out how to prevent the bubonic plague from spreading. Talks about isolation. You read about that in the laws of Moses. Answer B, human waste should be buried. Basic sanitation. You'd think people would know that, but I've been in a lot of countries of the world where they don't know it. And they just have typhoid and cholera and all kinds of disease because they're not practicing biblical sanitation. It says this back in the Bible times. Washing the body and clothing controls germs. God talked about the importance of washing, regularly washing your body and your clothing. And I hope you'll write down questions on this lesson. D, living morally helps prevent sexual diseases. I think all of us know that that's practical good sense. Answer E, animal fat should not be eaten. Not only that, the Bible says animal fat and blood should not be eaten. Disease can be transferred from animal to animal. In fact, you know, they're still speculating that they're not exactly sure what the animal was, but they're pretty sure that this pandemic originated in China and it had to do with uh, either a pangolin or a bat or some animal. Many of the flus, the swine flu, the bird flu, it's because of people getting disease from animals. You've never heard of someone spreading a virus because they got it from blueberries. You don't get a virus from bananas. Another good simple rule for health, anything you get addicted to is probably not good for you. I've never seen a person start shaking and you say, what's the problem? And they say, I haven't had Brussels sprouts all day. Just, it just always happens with the things that aren't good for you. Hatred and bitterness is detrimental to one's health. So it's not just what you eat. Some people are unhealthy because of what's eating them. God talks about forgiveness, doesn't he? That's a health practice in the Bible. Say amen. amen. Overeating is harmful. And friends, this is such an important lesson. We're living in a world and a culture where more people now are dying from eating too much than starvation. Isn't that shocking? We're eating in a time in the world where our kids are more likely 
to have shorter lives than us because of their lifestyles. Childhood diabetes is an epidemic right now. And overeating soda pop is liquid candy. And kids are always walking around nursing sodas, and it's just a really big problem. It's bankrupting our country, too, the health issues. Answer H, our bodies need proper rest. We've learned about the Sabbath truth. Amen? I, the importance of work. Not only does the Bible say that you should be resting, but it says six days you should work. And when you work, it gives you exercise. Wasn't work part of God's original plan for Adam? We need, and in a world today where some people, the only exercise they get is putting batteries in the mouse or the remote control, uh, we don't get the exercise we used to get. And so we need to get out. If you're in a sedentary job, get out. Use your muscles. Exercise. You've got to make it be disciplined about that if you want your body to function well. A positive attitude is good medicine. That sometimes just takes mental training. Do not keep falling into the trap about thinking about the regrets and bitter things and negative things. Train yourself to be grateful for your blessings. It is better for your health. And you know, it's healthy to laugh. It releases endorphins. The other thing is being a good influence. Parents' habits affect the children. So a lot of people are unhealthy because they adopted lifestyle habits from their families. They've not gotten the victory over those things. And uh, so be careful that you make those changes in your life or it can be generational. Number 16, will people in heaven kill and eat animals? What does the Bible say? The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child will lead them. Again, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. The animals will not kill and eat, uh, eat each other. So friends, are we going to kill and eat them? The Bible tells us, Revelation 21, 4, there is no more death. Nothing dies. And we will not be killing and eating them. So how do I make these lifestyle changes that will please the Lord? Not only please the Lord, make you feel better, help you be a better servant, how do you do that? How do you make these practical changes? I mean, let's face it, you get into a rut of lifestyle, habit, and it's hard to break. Well, you learned your habits, you learn new ones. With God's help, everything can change. There's a promise in Ezekiel 11:18, they will take away the detestable things. When you realize there's something in your life that doesn't please the Lord, throw it away. One day I had to throw my cigarettes away. One day I had to pour my alcohol down the drain and I stopped drinking. And there was a struggle for a while, but you know what? I don't struggle anymore. Because you change, you replace it with something good. You overcome your habits. He says, I will give them a new heart and I'll put a new spirit within them that they might walk in my statutes and teach my judgments and do them. You know, it's wonderful to consider, friends, that God honored Daniel and his friends for keeping those health laws. They ended up with long lives. They ended up 10 times wiser. And God then could use Daniel to communicate prophecy to you and me. Having healthy bodies and clear minds help us to comprehend the things that we're going to be getting into. God wants you body, soul, and spirit in the last days. We're living in a time in the world where people are really struggling uh, with their health. And God wants to give you the victory and uh, to bless you. You know, I'd like to invite John to come up and sing, and Kelly will be playing. And uh, I'd like to close uh, this meeting by praying for you. How many of you would like to admit and say, you know, Pastor Doug, there's things in my life where I could do better. There's things in my life I'd like to change, and I need God's power to do those things. I'm raising my hand, too. Amen. And some of you at home, God sees you raise your hand. You say, Lord, help me to make these changes so my body can be your temple. Nothing between my soul and my Savior, naught of this world's delusive dreams. I have renounced all sinful pleasures. Keep thy way. my soul and my Savior, so that His blessed face may 
may be seen, nothing resisting the things of all pleasure, for Jesus is mine, and there's nothing between. Amen. Friends, is there something that's kind of become an anchor in your life, it's hindering you in your walk with Jesus. Maybe there's some habit or practice and you'd like to be free. You'd like to see the chains broken. Jesus came into the world to break the chains and to set the captives free and help us develop new healthy habits where our bodies can be a living sacrifice and he can inhabit that temple. You want him on the inside, don't you, friends? Father in heaven, give us the victory. Fill us with your spirit. Set us free. We give you our bodies and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, friends. And next meeting, we look forward to seeing you Friday night, Mother and Daughter Conspiracy, talking about Babylon. Look forward to seeing you.